main subject of today's discussion is editing. But before I come to editing proper, I'd like to talk about film and the nature of film, the medium. Now, uh, there are three words which we tend to use synonymously. One is film, the other is cinema, and the third is movie. But French theorists are fond of making a kind of distinction, you know. The filmic, according to them, is different from the cinematic as is the movie-like. Now, I'd like to recall these subtle differences so that you can understand the nature of the medium of cinema. Appreciate why it is different from other media. And having understood the medium of cinema, maybe then we can move into editing, which is but a part of the entire filmmaking process. Now, when I use the word filmic, and this is not an original thought. Several theoreticians have talked about it in the manner that I will be talking to you. I mean using a political dimension. Therefore, the filmic refers in the adjectival sense to the political dimension of film. What do I mean by political dimension? I mean the relationship that film has with the world or with society. Whenever I try to draw attention to the fact that this film relates to the world in this way, or this is the way in which society is portrayed in this film, when a film has a message, when it has something to say about mirroring or reflecting society, I will use the term film or filmic. The second term, which is again used synonymously, but which I think is slightly different, is the term cinema. When I use the term cinematic, I am referring to the aesthetic dimension of cinema. The aesthetic as distinct from the political. Now, can you tell me, what do you understand by the term aesthetic? Something related to the art. Let's have some more opinions. He says something related to the art or the arts or the art form. Any other comment? I say art. Art again. Something else? Well, the word aesthetic is an umbrella term. It's a kind of rubric. And it has several strands of meaning. It's a difficult word. At the same time, it's a very simple, all-encompassing word. It certainly refers to the art of cinema. He's right, the aesthetics means the art. It also refers to the beauty of cinema. Aesthetics refers to a kind of beauty, which beauty is not always pleasurable, perhaps. It's not pleasure-giving beauty, but it's beauty relating to the way you compose frames, maybe related to the norms of Renaissance optics, Beauty related to the way you use colors in cinema. Beauty related to the way one visual follows another in a flow of images. The camera angles, maybe. The way the dialogues are spoken. The way the story is constructed. Or the way a documentary unfolds before you. All of these relate to a kind of beauty and to an art. Whenever I'm talking about the beauty of cinema, and the art of cinema, I'm referring to the aesthetics. And the third word is movie. Now, I'm not going to give you the answer here. What exactly is the dimension that the movie conveys? Can you tell me? What does this word movie, what does it conjure up in your mind? What kind of a reaction do you get when you hear the word movie spoken, as distinct from film or cinema? Something which is moving. The image. Correct. Something which is moving. Therefore, something which is immediate. Something which relates to immediacy. Therefore, it's not philosophical. Whereas the political could be philosophical. Whereas the aesthetic could be philosophical. The movie is more practical, more materialistic, more related to our everyday life, more related to the way we relate in the world, more related to business and to commerce. Therefore, movie, which was invented by the Americans, I mean the word movie, not necessarily the entire medium. We do know that the medium was invented parallelly by Thomas Alva Edison on the one hand, 
in America and by the Lumiere brothers. Although you must know that though Edison did a lot of business, it was actually a man called William Kennedy Laurie Dixon, W.K.L. Dixon, who actually invented the kinetoscope, the machine that Edison used. And the patent was taken out by Edison. Anyway, be that as it may, whenever I use the word movie-like, I am referring to the economic dimension of movies. And that's a very important dimension too, because films are produced, they are distributed, they are exhibited, and they are also consumed, like products. So, are we clear about this? About the difference, although subtle, between film, cinema, and movie? Film, we refer to the political dimension, how it relates to the world. Cinema, the aesthetic dimension, how it relates to the beauty and the art of cinema, as it were. And movie? Economic dimension. The economic dimension, absolutely correct. That's excellent. Having talked about the three different dimensions, we'll take one of them, that's cinema, and then move into editing. Now, there's still a few steps to go before we actually come to editing. What is the nature of cinema as a medium? This is something which you must understand. Now, you know that uh, in cinema, the moving picture is seen as a moving picture because of two phenomena principally. What are they? How do we perceive the moving picture in cinema as the moving picture because of two phenomena? What are they? Perseverance of vision. Persistence of vision. Persistence of vision. Please be clear about it. Not perseverance, but persistence. That's one. This is a physiological phenomenon. Persistence of vision. Correct? It's a physiological phenomenon. It's to do with our physiology. And the other is the phi phenomenon. Phi is a letter of the Greek alphabet, like alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, etc. Phi. The phi phenomenon is a psychological phenomenon. These are the two principal phenomena, but there are two others. One is called masking, and the other is called flicker fusion. So these are basically four phenomena, as a result of which we see the moving picture as the moving picture. It's not actually moving. It's an illusion of movement. You'll have to study about these separately because the scope of this particular lecture does not include a detailed analysis of either persistence of vision or the five phenomenon. All I can tell you is about the persistence of vision is when you see an object, after you stop seeing that object, the image of the object that you saw before persists in your mind's eye for about one-tenth of a second. And this is utilized by cinema in showing images projected now at 24 frames per second which means that each frame is projected for only one twenty-fourth of a second, which is obviously less than one-tenth of a second. Therefore, the image persists, and we get an illusion of motion. The gaps in the middle are filled up by the psychological phenomenon, which was? The phi phenomenon. The phi phenomenon, correct. As a result of a joining of these two, we see very clearly cinema moving but actually it is not moving actually there are gaps which is why the famous filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard he made a very funny remark he said that film tells a lie 23 times every second anyway the point of mentioning these phenomena was to draw attention to the nature of the medium which is actually not moving Actually, it's composed of 24 still frames. Therefore, the moving picture, I conclude, is derived from the still picture. And here again, another famous theoretician whom you might have heard of, his name is Siegfried Krakower. He says that the characteristics of the still photograph are very important in our analysis of the nature of cinema. And he goes on to say that the primary important thing about the still photograph is that it is still and that it's a photograph. It's a moment frozen in time. 
which means that it's not really all that static. Can you tell me why? I'm saying, I propose to you something very controversial. I'm saying that in the still photograph, when you freeze a moment in time, we do not have something static, we have something dynamic. Why do I say that? That moment contains within it possibilities of several moments that came before and several moments that will come after. Therefore, it's dynamic. Therefore, cinema has this infinitesimal quality. This is what Krakauer is pointing to. Even in the still photograph, there is this concept of a flow, a flow of images. And since the still photograph or the still frame contains this quality of being infinitesimal, of being ambiguous, of having so many possibilities, the moving picture, which is cinema, must also have these characteristics. Therefore, there is no finality to cinema as there is in theater. It always has within itself multiple possibilities. Cinema is something which continues, which has an open-endedness. And this is what I'm trying to come to. Cinema basically needs to have a degree of open-endedness. And this is a quality of the medium. Krakauer also says that cinema is basically realistic. Ever since that fateful day on the 28th of December, 1895, in the Boulevard du Capuchin, when the Lumiere brothers, using their cinematograph, showed the train entering a station at Ciota. And the audience was really scared because they'd never seen anything like this before. The history of cinema has seen a divergence between realism on the one hand and expressionism on the other. For the purpose of our discussion on editing, let us begin basically with this realistic character of cinema, in that it approximates reality. It comes close to reality, but does not become reality. As Baza says, it becomes an asymptote of reality. Now, the concept of editing first germinated, perhaps, in a very, very, you know, ephemeral, subtle, unintentional way in a film called Watering the Gardener, which was made by the Lumiere brothers. Actually, the Lumiers had no concept of editing at all, and they didn't bother to, you know, use it. They just had actuality coverage. Train entering a station, train leaving a station, workers entering a factory, workers leaving a factory, feeding of the baby, etc. But until this watering of the gardener, there is an element of narrativity, and because there's an element of narrativity, there is an element of juxtaposition, and indeed, the joining of shots. Which brings us to the basic concept of what editing is. Can you tell me, you know, from a layman's point of view, or from the point of view of a film student, what do you understand by editing? Can I ask you, Nibirita? Anything. What can you say about editing? Um, just a position of shots put together. Okay, let's leave it at that. Juxtaposition of shots put together. Can you, Dipanita, say something? Anything yeah, else? It's uh, the cause basically to create an effect on the spectator's mind. Okay. Uh, the intention is to create an effect in the spectator's mind. Do you have something to say, Megdu? Yeah, it is cutting and assembling. Of okay, shots. cutting and assembling. So we've had some very interesting comments. Mm -hmm. Now, in this program, we've just come up with, she says, juxtaposition of shots. She, Dipanita, says, this effort in editing is to create a psychological effect in the mind of the spectator. You may have come up with something very interesting. You're saying cutting, splicing. Now, I propose to you, although definitions are to be avoided, you know, the famous uh, philosopher, the late Jacques Derrida, never believed in any definitions. Because when somebody asked him, how do you define deconstruction? He said, if I were to define deconstruction, that would defeat the very purpose for which I created this system. However, we will try to define editing. Editing does have the element of juxtaposition. It has the element of cutting. It has this element of psychological guidance. It has the element of splicing. It also has the element of joining and assembling. So if I were to combine all of this, I would make an effort to explain editing as a process in filmmaking which occurs after the basic shooting is over in which several shots are joined 
And in the joining of those shots, what one has to keep in mind is the ordering of the shots according to the story and the script. Second, one also has to keep in mind the duration or length of the shot. That is, how long that shot would stay on the screen. And this would be determined by the grammar and the principles of editing. Then, creating an assemblage, an assembly of shots to convey the entire story. In this case, it's addition. But there is also an element of subtraction because when you keep a shot on for a particular time, you cut off the dead material, the unnecessary material. So there is an element of cutting too. And finally, there is this element of juxtaposition, which, as Dipanita said, is psychological. Because by juxtaposing shots, placing shots side by side, you create in the mind of the spectator an effect that is perhaps not shown in any of those individual shots. This is also called montage, which we will come to later. This basically sums up what editing is. We've examined the nature of cinema, and we've said that it's realistic. Now, this cinema is usually planned. This planning is called the pre-production stage. After the planning is over, we go for shooting. We actually shoot it, whether it's fiction or whether it's documentary. That's the shooting stage. Having shot, if you're shooting on celluloid, you send the material to the laboratory where it gets processed and a positive emerges. That is your raw material with which you perform the editing. If you are shooting on video, be it digital video, or beta cam, or DJ beta, or any other of those HDTV formats, you have the material already even after you shoot, even as you shoot. You don't need to send it to the laboratory. You may need to do some color corrections on your machines. But whether you shoot on video, or on film, once you have the material, this process which I talked about of editing takes place after the shooting. What you need to note is that it's a post-production process. And there are some theoreticians, people like Sergei Eisenstein, the famous Russian filmmaker and theoretician, who have said that even that shooting part is preparatory. The actual filmmaking part is the editing part. The raw material is produced in the shooting, and now with the raw material, that's a revolutionary concept, you do the editing. What do you do exactly? Let's look at it practically, since we're talking about basic concepts. First, what you need to do is, you need to sort the shots. Sorting, this is the first stage in the editing. And here that concept of ordering will come in, because when you sort the shots, you try to place it in the order in which it would appear on the screen. Why do we shoot in a random order. It's not really random. But we don't shoot according to the way it's written in the script. That's because we can assemble it later. No, that's what we can do. But we do this for some specific reason. Like the indoor and outdoor. Convenience. That's correct. Excellent, Megdut. When we go to a particular location, we try to shoot all the scenes in that location. All the scenes according to a certain light condition. All the scenes according to a certain camera axis. Therefore, when it comes to the editor, he has to once again redo that and place it in the order in which the script was written. So that's the first stage, sorting. The second stage is syncing. This is what happens in cinema, in celluloid, but in video, it's already in sync. Can you tell me what do I mean by syncing? What is synchronization? Synchronization means uh, the combination of sound and uh, the rushes which has been taken. What is that rushes called? Sound and? Uh, images. Master uh... Images. It's called picture. Pictures. The synchronization of sound and picture. That's done by the editor in celluloid. What is the device which is used by which we do the synchronization? It's very important. There is a particular device which is used in shooting, and that device is used to actually synchronize the picture with the sound. What is it? Think about it. Just as you begin a shot, how do you begin? Have you been to a shooting 
Ramani says 27 by 2 by 3. And then what happens? Action. Before action. Uh, rolling, camera rolling. Camera rolling, then? Correct. The clapper. The clapper is used. Correct. That's a good answer, Nimedita. You use what is known as the clapper or the clap or the slate. The jaws of the clapper are open. And you say 27 by 2 by 3. And then, now, when I hit it, a sound is made. What the editor does is, he sees the frames. This is in the old system of linear. We will come to the nonlinear system later. He sees the frame in which the jaws of the clap are open. Then he sees the frame in which the jaws just close. At the point where it closes, the sound should have come there. It must naturally come there. So you mark it where it closes on the picture and mark the sound. You hear the sound. You know, if you play it slowly, it'll come like dup, dup, like that. Where that sound starts, you mark it again and sync the two. If the picture of the jaw closing is synchronized with the sound of that hitting of the clap, then your shot will be in sync. This has to be done with every shot and then they are ordered. So sorting, sinking. Having done the sorting and the sinking, the assistant editor hands over to the main editor, who will now sit for the actual intellectual process of editing. What does he do? Now, the assistant editor may have ordered the shots, but in editing, you might even change the order slightly, according to aesthetic considerations. That the editor will do. The editor is going to decide on the exact duration of each shot depending on certain aesthetic principles. Now, in the next episode, we are going to go into the aesthetic principles that govern editing. And before I conclude this episode, I'd like to bring to your notice two of the most important aesthetic principles which have come almost from the beginning of cinema, although not from the time of Lumiere. And you have, you know, indirectly referred to them also in our discussion today. The one is montage, which is fundamental to editing, and the other is decoupage. Montage spelled M-O-N-T-A-G-E, and decoupage spelled D-E-C-O-U-P-A-G-E. -E. Now, Nibidita said, one of the aspects of editing was the juxtaposition of shots, and montage does precisely this. Montage is the juxtaposition of shots with a view towards what you said, Dipanvita, creating a psychological state in the mind of the spectator so that the spectator thinks in a particular way. Now, this concept of montage was first, you know, I wouldn't say invented, but the one who brought this term into the limelight from the French language was none other than Sergei. Mikhailovich Eisenstein, the great Russian filmmaker and theoretician. Montage literally means assemblage, assemblage, as the French would say, assembly, setting up, like the pitching of a tent, setting up. This is the basic literal meaning. But when we use it in film, it means editing in French. Montage means editing. And when we use a theoretical dimension, we'd say that montage is the juxtaposition of shots to create a meaning in the mind of the spectator. We'll go into this in much greater detail in the next episode. What is decoupage? If the Russians really brought montage to the fore, the Americans brought decoupage to the floor, once again borrowing from the French. The word decoupage literally means cutting or slicing. It's a question of cutting and slicing. And in cinema, the French use it to mean a short breakdown. The Hollywood system of editing is called, and you must note this, decoupage, I've already spelt it for you, classique. C-L-A-S-S-I-Q-U-E. Decoupage classique may be defined as the Hollywood system of editing in which there are seamless transitions, in which you don't even feel that you're editing. 
in which the editing is invisible. And this is one of the great things about art. As Oscar Wilde said, art lies in concealing art. Hollywood created a system in which that art remained in the background. And you saw the narrative, the editor edited in so unobtrusive a manner that you were face to face with the narrative. Whereas in the case of Eisenstein and the Russians, there was emphatic, formalistic montage, which was done because a certain ideology was sought to be conveyed. We will explain this in greater detail and also go into the lives of Eisenstein and Pudovkin in the next episode of Basic Concepts of Editing. Music